Life of Jesus, a devotional study by Melva Perkis. Book 6, Chapter 7 When he was yet a great way off, wherever Jesus went, he drew to him publicans and sinners. Men separated from their fellows by their means of livelihood and their way of life. It was one of the Pharisees' greatest problems. They could not understand the attitude of Jesus in allowing these men even to approach him. That he should talk with them and sink to the depravity of accepting their hospitality was horrifying. His wonderful answer that he had come as a physician to tend the sick, and must therefore be among them, had not satisfied these Pharisees. So developed was the sense of their own righteousness, and so ingrained their contempt of these people, that the simile seemed lost on them. They could only understand the righteousness which was marked by separation from sinners. They had no difficulty in appreciating the asceticism of the Old Testament prophets, and even that of John the Baptist in the wilderness. But this man encouraged these outcasts from decent society, and whether he was in Judea, Galilee, or even out here in the Jordan Valley, they flocked to him. Now, whilst he was speaking of the demands of discipleship, they had surrounded him. He had even shared a meal with them. The latest example of their aversion led Jesus to a more detailed justification of his attitude than he had yet expressed. We may be thankful for it, because it evoked the three great parables of the lost sheep, the lost coin, and the lost son. In these human stories, Jesus brought out the wonderful truth that while the Pharisees were murmuring on earth and keeping their distance from these men who had come to Jesus, the Father himself and the holy angels were rejoicing that they who had been lost were now found. Moreover, the further lesson emerges that the position of the sinner who comes to the Father is far happier than that of those who cling to their ceremonial righteousness. They may not have gone astray in any conventional sense, but they have not come to Jesus. There is more joy in heaven for a repentant sinner than for them. The three parables form a beautiful harmony. The first two show the seeking love of God in his Son and in his Church, and the third traces the progress of the responsive love of man towards God. The first parable is a vivid and faithful picture of the true shepherd who, discovering that one of his sheep is lost, dedicates himself to the task of finding it. He does not count to the cost. He is undeterred by the weariness of the way, the rocks that bruise his feet, or the thorns which tear his flesh. At last he finds it. Artistic imagination has painted it high up on some well-nigh inaccessible rock, lonely, hungry, and helpless. There is no anger in the shepherd's voice as he calls. No rebuke at the waywardness which has caused him such trouble. He is the shepherd still. He does not drive it back toward the pasture. He does not even call it to follow him. Reaching out, he gently lifts it to his tired shoulders and brings it to the fold amid heavenly rejoicings. In the second parable, Jesus becomes prophetic. The picture is a more intimate one. The wilderness has become the house. The hundred sheep become the ten coins. The rich landowner has become the poor woman who has lost a coin, and lighting a candle sweeps the house and diligently searches until she finds it. 
Then she calls her friends and neighbours, bidding them to rejoice with her, because she has found what she has lost. Jesus seems to be speaking here of the time when his disciples continuing his work have become his church. But the emphasis remains upon the love of God, the importance of those that were lost, and the joy of restoration. The story of the prodigal son is surely the most moving of all the parables of Jesus. His three characters were the very actors in this drama of the fords of Jordan. The publicans and sinners who, ashamed of their ways, had come to Jesus to be lovingly received and protected from the scribes and Pharisees. The representatives of legal righteousness who betrayed their true character in their lovelessness and in their unconscious admission of their hypocrisy. Above all, the love of God revealed in Jesus, which is the true home of both brothers. It is a love which goes out to meet the younger one when he has come to himself and realise the folly and degradation of natural propensities. It is also a love which gently reasons with the uglier disposition of the elder, imploring him to come into the feast and share the Father's blessings. We shall be the poorer if we do not often meditate upon this beautiful parable shining in the sunlight of the Father's love in Jesus. It bears an intensely personal application for each one of us. We do not often go with the younger brother quite so far away from home, nor are many of us reduced to the degradation which was needful for him. Yet dare any of us claim that our feet have not strayed out into the selfish paths of our natural inheritance? Has not every one of us sought to use the portion of goods that falleth to us for our own pleasure? Few of us are so surly and hypocritical as the elder brother, but a sensitive awareness will show us when we are taking upon ourselves his likeness. It is a sober thought that the fact that we never leave our father's home does not mean that we are nearer to him than is our brother who, though far away among the swine, is beginning to realise what he has left and is saying in his heart, I will arise and go unto my father. Dominating the whole scene is the love of God. If we are far away, it seeks us out across the wilderness to call us home. If we dwell beneath its wings, it penetrates into the dark corners of our hearts and searches our motives. Responding to it, the elder and the younger brother can meet together, their hands clasped in fellowship, and enjoy the love feast the Father has prepared for them. We cannot leave this parable without seeking to extract from it a lesson in prayer. The younger brother's first approach to his father was the natural cry of a child, and is the spiritual cry of an immature Christian. It was a petition, give me the portion of goods. But when experience had taught him wisdom, he began to understand the true meaning of fatherhood. Eventually, having come to himself, he approached his father once more. But it was no longer, give me, it was, father, make me. So it is with us. Only the varied experiences of our spiritual warfare, which brings increasing confidence in God, will give us that maturity which leads us from simple prayers of petition to the intense habitual communion which seeks only the Father's transforming love and desires only to be like him. The Pharisees heard this story with some grimness, 
They could not miss the me its meaning, nor its invitation to join the publicans and sinners in enjoying the blessings of his father's love. But the elder brother maintained his surliness. He preferred to continue his hurt self-righteousness, and thus also to retain that approbation of men which he so dearly loved. Jesus saw that the appeal of his word pictures was lost upon them. He turned to his disciples and described these men to them, bringing out their inconsistency and summarising all hypocrisy in trenchant words which reached beyond the history of those men who served God to please men. No man can serve two masters. But either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. Ye cannot serve God and mammon. The scribes and Pharisees, stung by his words, curled their lips in sneers. But Jesus reminded them that however much they sought to justify themselves before men, God knew their hearts. That was the final test. To bring home its force, he told them the parable of the rich man and Lazarus. In doing so, he used their own conceptions of the afterlife, not because they were literally true, but because they forcibly illustrated the lesson he was teaching them. In the eyes of men, the condition of Lazarus could not bear comparison with the comfort and opulence of the rich man. Yet, when their relative positions in the sight of God were revealed, the situation was exactly reversed. The rich man had become the beggar in dire straits, longing for the simple gift of a drop of water from the hand of him, who had once desired the crumbs from his table. The beggar had become the rich man, enjoying comfort and plenty. In his wonderful way, Jesus used the occasion to bring home a further lesson which the Pharisees needed. Having drawn the picture in colours which compelled their attention, he represented the tormented man pleading that someone may be sent to warn his brethren of this completely different standard of values. Thus, repenting of their ways, they might be saved from bitter disillusionment. But the ways of God have been revealed. The relationship between God and man and the standards God requires have been fully shown. His constant warnings against hypocrisy were clear and forceful. If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded though one rose from the dead. Within a week, their conduct would prove the accuracy of his words. Was it a strange coincidence, or was it divine foreknowledge that a Lazarus should rise from the dead? Faced with the evidence of his resurrection, the Pharisees and priests from that day forth took counsel to put Jesus to death. Chapter 8. The Master is come, and calleth for thee. Tragedy now came to the little family at Bethany. Lazarus, the beloved brother of Mary and Martha, was struck down suddenly with a fatal illness. Looking at him as he lay on his bed, they saw the pallor of death was already upon him. Their thoughts flew to Jesus. He alone could help them. They knew he was somewhere in the Jordan Valley. How could they get to him? Here was a reliable man who could be trusted to find him with a minimum delay. They gave him the message, Lord, behold, he whom thou lovest is sick. That was all. No urgent request for him to come. It was enough that he knew their need. The messenger departed. 
In his absence, Lazarus grew rapidly worse. Probably during that night he died. The trust of the sisters was being severely tried. The burial had to take place almost immediately. Mourners came to perform their sad rites. Villagers flocked to the house and followed the bier to the tomb outside the town. Many friends came over from Jerusalem, two miles away. Everybody seemed to be in Bethany. Everybody except Jesus. He had not come. The messenger found him on the banks of Jordan. He received an answer to take back to the sorrowing sisters. This sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God might be glorified thereby. But it was already a house of death to which the man returned. Surely the rabbi had made a terrible mistake. Yet faithfully he repeated the words of Jesus. Bewilderment was added to their grief. What could he mean? So even Jesus had been wrong. Even he could not help them now. Did Mary understand? No, not even Mary. If only he had spoken the word. He had not even come. Was the messenger sure the rabbi had said nothing about coming? No, he had turned away and continued preaching. Heavy-footed, she went into the house in bewildered despair and grief. But Jesus had not forsaken those weeping sisters. As if to assure us, John records, now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. Coming where they do, the words assume a lovely significance. They suggest that his love for them was a test of his resolution. For two long days, while the women wept in Bethany, Jesus abode still in the same place where he was. An even greater love held him back. The love that desired to comfort their hearts with the assurance that he was the resurrection and the life. Two days accomplished, Jesus turned to his disciples. Let us go into Judea again. The words brought them apprehension. They had not forgotten the menacing shadows of the temple, the cries of abuse, the stones. Yes, the stones above all, they seemed too sharp a reminder of the things their Lord had told them were waiting for him there. Master, the Jews of late sought to stone thee. Goest thou thither again? Jesus reassured them. There were still some hours of daylight left before the hour of darkness came. With him, even in Judea, they will be in the light and will not stumble. Without him it matters not where they are, they will be groping in darkness. He told them the reason for his departure. Our friend Lazarus sleepeth, but I go that I may awake him out of sleep. Seizing eagerly the opportunity to remain in safety, they suggested that the crisis seemed to be over. If he slept, he would recover. Jesus spoke plainly. Lazarus is dead. He was glad he had not been there. Could his resolve have outlasted his love had he seen the silent suffering of those he loved at Bethany? Thomas, honest and loyal, fearful but faithful, gave a voice to his fear and his love. Let us also go that we may die with him. At Bethany the burial was over, the tomb was sealed, but the mourners remained to console. Martha was told that Jesus had come. She climbed the hill to meet him on the outskirts of the little town. Mary stayed in the house. Lord, cried the elder sister, if thou hadst been here, my brother had not died. 
but looking upon him after these days of anxiety and grief, she felt once more the strength of his presence. A flicker of hope stirred in her heart. She dare not dwell upon the full implications of it, even to herself. But suddenly it found expression. I know that even now, whatsoever thou wilt ask of God, God will give it thee. Jesus knew. Thy brother shall rise again. Yes, she believed that. He had been a dear, good man. There was the resurrection. But what of this aching void in her heart? What of the lovely home hidden now among the vines, the home that had suddenly become lonely and cheerless? Gently Jesus lifted her thoughts higher, beyond the present grief, beyond even the joy that her brother's restoration would give her for a few years before this scene was repeated. He had come to bring life, life more abundant, life that would triumph over this mortal span of years. Fellowship with him will bring her into a relationship with divine life, triumphant in its victory over death. I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. He looked into her face. Believest thou this, Martha? Ah! That was a challenge indeed. With true sincerity she could say she believed in him. Thou art the Christ, the Son of God, who should come into the world. With an indefinable hope she had left him there. Back in the little home where she had been taught the secret of true service, she found Mary surrounded by her friends. She drew her aside. The Master is come, and calleth for thee. Breathlessly, Mary rose and left the house. At last, at last, he had come. Half running, she climbed the hill towards him. The mourners watched her anxiously. She has gone to the grave to weep there, they thought. We cannot leave her. It was the Lord's purpose that they should follow to witness what was now to be done. Mary found her Lord waiting for her. With her heart bursting with relief and anguish, she threw herself at his feet. Brokenly she repeated what she had said to Martha so many, many times during the last few days. Lord, if thou hadst been here, my brother had not died. She could say no more. She lay at his feet, quietly weeping. The mourners could bear the sight no longer. Watching this sad figure prostrate, they wept. Jesus, the Son of God, looked on and was troubled in spirit. Gently he lifted her up. Where have ye laid him? Lord, come and see. They reached the tomb. The gravestone, cold and final, shut in Lazarus from the world of life and light. The silence was only broken by the weeping of the woman. But beyond the silence a prayer ascended. Jesus, now deeply moved, looked upon the scene. The stricken sisters of the family he loved, the mourning women, the rock-covered tomb, grey and silent. It was a picture in miniature of all that sin had wrought. This scene enacted down the ages and through ages yet to come. He will staunch these tears, but they will flow afresh. They will stream down the cheeks of those who have no comforter to bring restoration. Jesus wept. The mourners, watching in amazement, whispered one to another, Behold, how he loved him! 
Behold, rather, how he loved all mankind. And behold, not here in Bethany, look out over that distant shoulder of the rock that leans towards Jerusalem. There you shall behold how he loved. Reaching the cave where Lazarus lay, he asked Martha to have the stone removed. But Martha, practical still, said, Lord, by this time he stinketh. Martha had forgotten the words the messenger had brought from beyond to Jordan. Said I not unto thee, thou shouldst see the glory of God? The stone was rolled away, the cave yawned open. The prayer that Jesus offered, even whilst he wept, had been answered. I thank thee that thou hast heard me. Because of the people which stand by, I said it, that they may believe that thou hast sent me. Turning to the tomb, his voice rose in a ringing command. Lazarus, come forth! And he that was dead came forth. We turn to Christ in our moments of suffering and trial. Our need is enough for his love. But sometimes he remains away, and we do not understand the message he sends. The crisis comes and goes. Perhaps we are left grief-stricken and alone. But one day we shall hear the summons. The Master is come. He calleth for thee. Before the open grave he will show us that he is the resurrection and the life. And he that believeth on him, though he were dead, shall live. Then we shall see the completed pattern of our lives, and we shall know that the sorrow and the suffering made up the fullness of his love.